Till now, I've lost 10 pounds. <laughs>
amazing and beautiful than it does wherever it's from. A lot of the plants and vegetation that we have here isn't isn't indigenous. Is that what it yeah. uh, To the land here, it's brought in. Yeah. Amen. And it's even better when it's cooked. So we can easily see the harvest being plentiful on the island. Yeah. Amen. So it's not hard for us to see that. Amen. But when I think of harvest, what do you think of when you think of the word harvest? Who harvest? You think of a farmer, right? If not, then that's what we're going to think about this morning. I mean, that's what I think about. When I think of harvesting, I think of farming. I think of being a farmer. Yeah. And it's amazing because when you think of a farmer who is a true farmer, what does a true farmer look like? A true farmer is dedicated to their land. Yeah. A true right. farmer is dedicated to the harvest. When they wake up, that's the first thing they go after. They, they, because why? It's because they depend on that harvest. Yeah. There being a harvest every season is what's going to feed their families. Yeah. So it's going to grow their children into farmers, possibly. But they're going to grow their children to be strong and great men and women. That feeds the community. If there's no harvest, if they don't focus on the harvest, then their community doesn't get fed. If they don't focus on the harvest, there's no roof over their head. They literally will die, physically die, if they don't focus on the harvest. A true farmer is dedicated because they see the necessity in the harvest. Amen? Amen. Unfortunately, what I think can happen spiritually, even in God's church, and it's happened to me, so if it's happened to me, I just assume, because I'm a normal guy, that it's happened to, it can happen to any of us, and it possibly has, is that we can become what I like to call hardy, or hobby harvesters. For myself, when I lived in Riverside, I was moving everywhere where I moved, uh, obviously before I came here, when I, when I had a house in Riverside, in the backyard I had a small garden. And it was a pretty awesome garden for myself. I was trying to get into it, so I was kind of like into this mindset of like, oh, when the apocalypse comes, I gotta be able to take care of myself. I had like a small little windmill that created electricity. I was trying to get like, what are those things called on your roof? Uh, solar panels, but I didn't get enough sun on my roof to get them. And I was like all up, all about that. And I had this small little garden. I had some pretty awesome stuff. I had really long grapevines, yellow or green and then red grapes. I had cucumber, I had cilantro. I had a watermelon, cantaloupe, uh, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries. So I was like, really, it was a small little spot, right? A small little spot, but it was a hobby. Because I didn't really depend on what grew from that harvest. I would go to Walmart and in other stores, and I would, I would buy my groceries there. And then every now and then, about twice a week or so, then I would go check on the harvest, because it was just a hobby to me. And I'm like, oh, how's it doing? I'll water it, you know, I'll, I'll take pictures like, oh, look what I did. <laughs> I don't really believe that I'll be doing it. 
Well, I don't really believe that's what God made me. Or maybe believe the church will be fruitful, but I don't know about my Bible talk. I don't know about, about if it will be fruitful. Amen. Amen. You guys ever thought those kind of things? Yep. Yep. I'm sure we have. I know I have. Amen. <laughs> the problem is here, we're going to jump right in. John 15, verse 7. John 15, verse 7. What I want to do before we get into our points is start to demolish some of these negative thinking that we might have on, bro, as, as, as Christians. Amen? John 15, verse 7. The Bible says, If you remain in me, this is Jesus speaking, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, proving yourselves, that, proving yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is saying, God is saying, that he expects you as an individual to be fruitful. Yeah. He expects you to be fruitful. He doesn't care about what the world tells you about who you are or who you're not. God made you perfect in his eyes. Amen. He designed you to be a farmer. He designed you wow. to be a warrior. He designed you to be a brother or a sister. He designed you to be those things. The world, I think, what happens from birth, we're born and then in God's image. We're going to dig into that a little bit in a moment. And then over time, God, the world gives us this, this sinful nature, yeah. right? This sinful or this worldly nature where we say, oh, that's just, that's just how I am naturally. That's just who I am, right? But the thing is that that's not who you are naturally. Naturally, you're who God says you are. That's right. He expects you to be fruitful because you're made, you're made naturally a farmer. He expects you to be forceful because naturally you're made a warrior. But but the world kind of corrupts all of this in our hearts, right? right? I see that. Yeah. We're keeping kept ourselves saying those kind of things. Well, it's not natural for me to, to go and share my faith. No, you're right, it's not. But that's because the world has destroyed that in your heart. Because God made you naturally a faith sharing monster. Yeah. You just gotta go get that. Amen? Amen. So no, it's not true that you're made a cheerleader and that's all you are. Yeah, you're a cheerleader, we're all cheerleaders, that's awesome. I never thought of myself as a <laughs> but, but I am, because God knows that I need to cheer my family on. Amen. I need to inspire my family, just as each of us have to do. But he also made me a farmer. Amen? And you guys are farmers as well. Maybe another question is, I just don't think it's time for the harvest. Come on, bro. Maybe, maybe once I become a Bible talk leader, then I'll care about bearing fruit. Maybe once I'm done with my, my load of five classes this semester, then I'll bear fruit. Maybe once I become a disciple someone, then I'll live as the example. Maybe once my kids move out of the house, then I'll go share my faith. Whatever it is, it's not time for the harvest right now. There's plenty of scriptures to look at, but one scripture I want to look at is in Genesis 8. Let me tell you old school. Back to the roots. The roots of the harvest. Amen. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. God says, while the earth remains, meaning while, the, while everything is here, if you're here on earth, then that means this is still happening. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease, shall not go away. What does that mean? It means that it is always time to harvest. It is always time to share a faith. It is always time to make disciples. It is always time to wash people in the word and in the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. It's always time. So that means that God knows our priorities. God knows our life situations. God knows what we're dealing with and, and how much we can handle and so forth. But what God also knows and expects is that you can still share your faith. You can still harvest the land that God put before you. Amen? Amen. That's amazing, right? Because this is, now we're going to go into, maybe after, you know, all this time of, God, I've been sharing my faith with everyone at school and no one's open. I've been sharing my faith with everyone at my work and no one's open. I've been sharing with, with my family members and they keep turning me down or they keep shutting me up. Nothing's been happening. And then you get in this mindset of maybe it's just too hard. It's just, you know what, maybe it's just not worth it for me to even put in the effort. And what happens is our hearts get lazy. We start getting sidetracked with other things. A lot of people uh, bash on Netflix. I think Netflix is awesome, but you don't want to abuse it, amen? amen? But you start maybe watching too many Netflix movies during the day when you could spend an hour and go out and just talk to people and, and share or you like with them and meet new people around your neighborhood. Amen. Instead, you, you become a hermit and you hide yourself away. 
because you've already been through too much pain, you've already seen too much uh, <coughs> letdowns or, or situations that didn't work out the way you hoped for. Wow. So you start to pull your heart back from all these all these things, right? But the problem is, is that we can become lazy in our hearts. Yeah. In Proverbs 10, come on, bro. Okay. You guys with me? Yeah. Oh. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Proverbs 10, verse 4. The Bible says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Amen. We, he who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son, diligent son, but he, or, or daughter, but he or she who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son or daughter. To sleep during the harvest. So when is the harvest? It's all the time. So if you're spiritually sleeping, then what is that doing before your God? What image is that putting before your God? That's all that really matters. Who cares about looking pretty and, and, and appearing religious to people? That's all garbage. That means nothing before God. If he sees the heart alone and he sees, wow, yeah, at church you seem fired up and you're singing the songs and you're clapping and praise Jesus, hallelujah, and all this other stuff, but then at home you shut down, you shut out, I'm not moving off this couch until someone makes me, or until Bible talk time, and, and you come to Bible talk just on time, which is late, right? You're, you're coming in bright mom's house and you're starting. So you're coming in Bible talk late, and, and you're there physically, but you're not spiritually there. God's looking at all this, and he's like, why even, why even bother? Come on, bro. This is a disgrace. It's a disgrace to me, what you're putting before me. What God's after is the diligent heart. To see, like, I don't care how many times people say no, someone's going to say yes. Why? Because I said yes. And look at me. <laughs> Someone reached out to me and thought, this guy's worth it. And now I get to stand here before my family. Someone thought you were worth it. And decided, you know what? I'm going to bring him out the Bible talk. I'm going to bring him out of church. I'm going to ask if they're willing to study the Bible. Let's just see what God has to say. Let's give him a chance. What do you have to lose? Nothing. But you have everything to gain. We need to cut that out of our hearts. And I'm not saying that. I'm sure none of us here have struggled with this. Amen. Come on, bro. But I know I have. So, I mean, if that's the case, then we have to, if you can see it in your heart, you have to cut it out. Who cares about everyone else? Cut it out of your heart for your own salvation, for your own walk with God. And when you cut it out, then you get to enjoy it because now, wow, I get to embrace the family again because I cut out the poison that was in my heart for whatever reason and whatever area. And be diligent in what God put me to. Amen? Amen. The harvest. Maybe, maybe another question is, the harvest isn't that big of a deal. It's not that important. I don't really think that, that it's that important to God for us to go and share our faith. I don't think that he, he means that we have to do that. I, I understand we got to make disciples and so forth, but do, do we really have to go as a Bible talk or as a small group, really what it is, and, 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 and inspire each other to go and meet people? You see, what I love about God's kingdom is that it truly is a family. What, the way I see it is this. Individually, we're going to see through scriptures, God commands us each individually to bear fruit, right? It's an individual command. That means that whether you're here with everyone or, or you're off on your own island, the, the, the conviction is still the same. The calling is still the same. The command is still the same. But what God done, has done, because God is a father and he wants to have children, that's why we call him the father, and then he puts his family together. He says, look, I'm going to help you guys out. Instead of having to do it individually, you get to come together as a family, and you get to go out and inspire each other and encourage each other to go and bear fruit together. So as a family, we have to make up protocols and ways we do things, right? So we say, hey, you know what? Because the command is that we go out and we bear fruit, well, let's form small groups so we can keep small accountability on each other. It's not this large thing that gets out of control. Small groups, and we go out as a family, and we obey this command. We keep each other accountable. So now we have a small group. We call it a Bible talk. Where we go out, and the focus is to go and reach out to people. That means if we don't have visitors at Bible talk, we don't have Bible talk. Right? So we go out, and we meet people. <coughs> we don't have visitors. Okay, let's cancel the discussion. Let's right? go out to our area of operation, whether it be a shopping mall, whether it be whatever, campus, or whatever, and we're going to go find someone to get into the scriptures. That's what Bible talks about. Obeying God's command. We do it together. We inspire each other. For how fortunate we are to not have to do it on our own. Amen? Amen. That we are able to put these things into place and be as a family and keep each other accountable so that we can see, make it at the end. Amen? Amen. Amen? But to God, the 
The harvest is everything. God is the ultimate farmer, and he's not a harvest, a hobby farmer. Yeah. Amen. He's the, the harvest is everything to God. And in fact, in Genesis 1, 26, go with me there. Keep it in old school for now. Amen. Okay. Come on, bro. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the sky, and the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So we are made in God's image. Now this doesn't necessarily mean physical image. Take it how you want it on that. But what I really think it means is in his, in his likeness is to have his heart, to have his desire, to have his personality, his, his wants. To have, well, to, 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 to be made in his image is to be like, you know, like an apple doesn't fall far from the tree. When, when the son acts like his father, he's like, oh, he's made, like, he's definitely his father's child. He's definitely, she's definitely her mother's daughter. Or whatever, however you want to say it. Amen? Amen. But I think that's what it really refers to, is having the heart of God being yeah. made in his image. And then one chapter later, in Genesis 2, verse 15, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. We are literally created to work God's land. Spiritually, we understand God's harvest is people, his creation. The harvest, the land that God is referring to, of course we take care of our, our physical land, amen, amen. and respect the land, and all, and all those things. <laughs> but what he's referring to spiritually is the people. And we are called literally to be harvesters of God's people. To go out into the world. And you can look around right now. Look at all the empty seats we have. This is a, this is a great vision, though. This is a great place to be in the sense that we can be in a room where we can see the opportunity before us. Amen. There are people out in, on this island right now that are desire, that truly desire, maybe they don't know it fully yet, but truly desire to be disciples, to be Christians, who are walking around just waiting for one of us to go and meet them and bring them in in love and let them know, hey, I'll, I'm right there with you, I know better than you, I've been in your shoes, and I'm going to help you come into mine. The shoes that God gave. And we're going to walk through this together. And this room will be full. It should be full of people who are around this island not realizing that they're called to be our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Waiting to come into the family. That's what God's hope and desire is. That's what we're called to do. To be co-workers. To be farmers in God's harvest. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to go into our main scripture. Matthew 9, verse 35. This is where we're going to spend a little bit of the time this morning. You guys fired up? Yeah. You guys fired up, you farmers? Amen. Lord. Amen. Come on, bro. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. What's really going to help us coming into the Bring Your Neighbor Day and really throughout the year is to really focus in on this. Keep this at heart. What is it that God is calling me to do? What is it that God is calling me to be this year? And this is a big part of it. To be a farmer. The scriptures refer to farming many times. Usually two of the main things that God refers people or us to is farming and soldiers and also athletes. So studying those three out, like, wow, God called me to be a farmer, so what does a farmer really look like? What kind of mentality and work ethic and personality and all these things are great things to study out. A soldier, what is the mentality and work ethic and heart of a soldier? Is that who God sees me as? Designed me to be. Amen? But today we're going to focus in on farming. And here, in chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 35, we'll pick up. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out in workers into his harvest field. Point number one, the harvest is plentiful. Straight to the point. Verse 37, Jesus describes the harvest as plentiful. We already seen in scripture in John 4 that the harvest is ripe. Do you guys ever seen, like, a, my favorite fruit, I think, is mango. Yeah. Like a super ripe mango. When they're not super ripe and ready to go, it's kind of like, it's good, but it's 
it's like, ah, uh, yeah, that was cool. That was a nice mango. But when it's like super juicy, and I don't know, like, uh, when, in California, we have a lot of those, like, uh, they, they drive around, they walk around with these carts with, like, mangoes on a stick um, all over, and then you, they, it's like, but they're like monster mangoes. I'm sure you guys have bigger mangoes out here. I haven't seen them. I don't think they've seen them. They're like that big. And then they just take it on a stick and they take this machete and they cut it into like a flower look and they put like pica on it, like hot sauce and stuff. But they're like crazy mangoes. And I always get excited, like, where do you guys, I don't understand where you guys get these. Like, when I go to the store, they're always like these little mangoes and like, they're like kind of hard and I'll be like waiting like weeks for them to ripen <laughs> in my fridge. And, but like, for some reason, they always have like the perfect mangoes on their cart. And they always make them amazing. But, it, but it's amazing when you get to see like the true ripe piece of fruit. Yeah. Right? Don't you get it fired up? Like, man, this is yeah. awesome. I'm going to like, dive into this. This will be memorable. I'm not going to wash my whole face. <laughs> the juice is going to go everywhere. It's going to be sticky. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to forget this for a while if I don't wash my hands right away. Right? You get fired up about it. That's the same kind of heart that, that God has towards us. Yeah. When he sees our hearts fully ripe and ready to go. The thing is, is that though it is plentiful, we got to see that the world is huge. Yeah. The world is huge. We know that. The harvest is plentiful, but the world is also big. In fact, in around 8,000 BC, it's estimated that only about 5 million people were on the planet. Wow. 5 million people. That's, that's not much at all, honestly. On the planet. 5 million people in 8,000 BC. In the first century, so say from zero, year zero, in the first century, from 125 to 200 million people roamed the earth. Still pretty small. 300 million people are in America alone. As of a couple years ago, in the census. Amen? So not even the amount of people in America were what accumulated around the planet in the first century. Come the 1700s, when the Industrial Revolution hit, and all of a sudden people were living a lot longer, babies were actually making it into childhood, amen? Up to, I think it's the 1900s, we hit 1 billion people as a population on the planet. Now fast forward to today, Come to 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people squeezed into this planet. 9 billion people. 9 billion people. If they were baptizing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the first century, when there was only millions, hundreds of millions, up to 200 million people on the planet, how many disciples do you think should be disciples, should be people, children of God, are walking the planet right now? Millions. I believe millions and preferably not billions of people who should be filling our seats with true relationship to God. What's standing in the way of them, of them taking these seats? Us right here. We're the co-workers. Now, God doesn't need our help. It's not like God's like, yeah, man, I really leave it up to you guys. And I can't do this, and I need you guys to go and bear the fruit. No, he's saying, like, I got this, but I want my kids to put, have a part in my business. Amen. This is my business of bearing fruit. I'm a farmer, and I want my kids to be part of my family business. Amen. Are you part of your family's business, your father, of your father's business? Come on, bro. It's going to show through your work ethic, That's right. through your heart, through your desires, what you wake up and do, what you worry about when you go to bed. If you're part of your father's business, if you're truly a farmer in God's house, in God's field. Eight, nine billion people in like 20 years. That's, that's crazy. Right now, I think we're about seven. Literally, we grow about 20, or was it, 200,000 babies every day. As wow. 200,000 babies are born every day. Every day. We're still trying to get one.
It's because we're not going to the Lord of the harvest. In verse 38, Jesus said, look, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. We're the few. And there's people out there who want to add to the numbers, who are desiring to be with God. But the thing is, is that we think we can do it on our own. That's right. How many times do we go on campus and we go to Bible talk and yeah, we pray for the food and we pray for the time, but then we fail to pray for the harvest. We fail to ask God, who's at the gate of the, of the field, who says, like, hey, you guys want to go pick fruit? you got to talk to me first. This is my field. Unless you talk to me, you're not going to bear any fruit. How crazy would it be for us to bear fruit, for you to baptize someone who you never prayed to baptize, who you never asked to meet? And you just, on your own will, it's like, oh, yeah, I baptized him. I made him a disciple. I met him. I didn't even ask God to meet this guy. I just met him. And I, I, because of how cool I am, I baptized him, and now he's a disciple of me. Wow. You want that on your head? No. I don't want that on your head. Amen? Amen? The thing is that God is saying, you have to ask the Lord of the harvest. You want to bear fruit? The fruit's there. It's falling to the ground. There's so much fruit, it's just wasting away. But you need to ask the Lord of the harvest. we got to be praying. we got to be a family of prayer, you guys. Because of the year of impossibilities, it has to start with impossible prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. How, much, how much are you praying to be fruitful? How much are you praying for your Bible talk? It doesn't matter if you're the Bible talk leader. That's the title Amen? That's right. If you're in the Bible talk, that's part of, you're part of that Bible talk. Right. You're part of that small group. You still have the same commands given to you as the Bible talk. It doesn't change. It doesn't get added. Amen? Yeah. So are you praying for your Bible talk? God, open the, open the floodgates. Let us be fruitful. If you're not being fruitful, it's not because the fruit's not there. Yeah. It's because something's wrong with your basket. Cool. Something's wrong with your neck. Wow. Why is God going to get you praying for fruit, but you're not repenting of your sin? You're praying for fruit, but you're not sharing your faith. Uh, you're just going to sit at home, and I'm going to bring someone in, like, hey, you watch Netflix? Oh, I want to watch Netflix. <laughs> Some random dude. You're not going to let that dude into your house. You're going to share your faith. You're like, full of life or something. Wow. Uh, <laughs> 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 Amen. But, but you see, we have to actually go out. I have, I like knives. Amen. But we have to actually go and, and become part of the harvest team. We go to the Lord of the harvest. Something's wrong with the basket. Okay, repent so that you don't spoil the fruit. You have to spoil the fruit in your basket. All this unrepentant sin and, and bickering and, and disunity and all this stuff in your basket. You think God wants to add fresh fruit to that basket? To spoil that fruit too? And now all the fruit spoiled? No. Take care of the fruit that you have. Bend the basket, <laughs> tighten the weave on the basket, tighten the weave on the net. So when you go fishing, when you go to harvest, you can actually catch something and it will stay. Amen? Fruit that will last. But you have to first go to the Lord of the harvest. Amen? Amen? How dare we think we can do it on our own? You see, God is the one who gives us fruit. In Amos chapter 4, verse 7, and I'm just going to read it here. It says, I also, this is God's meaning, I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain to one town. But withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. You don't want to be in the field that dries up. God controls the harvest. Yeah. It's his harvest. So when he sees that you guys are ready for fruit, you guys have been diligent in your works, you guys have been purifying your hearts, you guys have been true to your word, you guys are ready to take care of someone who comes into your family. That's another thing we have to ask. Am I ready to bear fruit? Can I, if I bear fruit, who's going to take care of me? Who's going to disciple me? Maybe I have to disciple me. Am I discipling myself? Am I, am I holding to the scriptures and letting the word refresh me and taking advice and applying it to my life so that I'm ready? I'm a fresh fruit, and someone added to, to my basket, to my under my wing, isn't going to get dried up and spoiled as well. Yeah. Amen. So these are good questions to be asked. Yeah. And we're going to be going out this week and this year, right being going out into the right harvest and harvesting the fruit that is before us. Amen. Amen. So God can control the harvest and keep rain from coming to it. But in Leviticus 26, verse 4, it says, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground you, you, you will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. See, God will bring in the harvest once we're ready to take care of it. Amen. And then once we go to God in prayer and fasting and bringing in the fruit. Amen? Amen. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is ripe and waiting for us to go out and get it. These Amen. seats are waiting to be filled. And warmed by someone sitting in there. Brothers and sisters who are going to be sitting there looking at you. Best friends that you don't even know yet. Who are waiting to be there. Family members who you have been dying to see in the, in the room. Praising God in truth and spirit. 
who are wanting to take those seats. Right. And you just got to start there. You want your family to be saved. You want your friends to be saved. You want your coworkers to be saved. You want your, the guy at the gas station to be saved. You want the guy that you just see walking on the street to be saved. Go to the Lord of the Harvest and beg God to bring in the fruit. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys with me? Amen. The harvest is there. Point number two, the harvest is precious. Amen. In Matthew 9, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw those people around him, and he had compassion on them. These are the same people that were eventually going to kill him, many of them. And how did Jesus see those people? Even on the cross, how did he see those people who beat him, who mangled him, who spit in his face, who disgraced him? How did he see them? Helpless and harassed. He had compassion on them, even on the cross. How many people have you reached out to who have last, laughed in your face? I've been laughed at in my face on campus. <laughs> a lot of times. There's been times where <sighs> some of my simple nature is not to act nicely or kindly. I, I, I struggle in a lot of these ways, but I've had times where I'll reach out and just try to be loving. Like, hey, uh, would you like to study the Bible? We have a Bible talk coming up. And they just look at me and they start laughing. With that, like, an obnoxious laugh, where, like, their mouth's open, and their hot breath is on my face, <laughs> and, and, like, sometimes even, like, some of their saliva can, like, come out of their hot breath mouth and, like, land on your face, and the first thing you want to do is, like, retaliate. <laughs> like, come on, bro. Amen. I'm not going to do that. I'm pray for this guy. I have to see them. You have to literally see them as harassed and helpless. Yeah. Because not too long ago, I'm only been a disciple for about four years. Not too long ago, I've been right there on that other side. I might not have been that disrespectful, honestly, but I definitely was disrespectful to God. Wow. Come on, bro. I was definitely laughing in God's face. My hot, stinky breath has been on God's face. My nasty saliva. Right? So we have to see them. We can't, we can't think we're any better than anybody. That's right. God rescued us, not through our will, but to His will. Yeah. And then turn around and say, now you're a farmer. Because you have not deserved this, go out and rescue them who have not deserved it as well. Amen? Amen. I remember one time on campus in Ventura, I think it was in Ventura, um, and uh, when I was in Ventura, I was the only, only guy in campus. We didn't have a really big campus ministry. I, was, I led campus ministry because I led myself. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember walking around and I was talking to somebody because they were asking me about, I went to the fire program and got a, a, an association in fire science and someone was asking me about the fire program on that campus, so I wasn't there for it. Um, and we were talking about like third degree burns for some reason. And I was talking about like how when you have third degree burns, like you don't, it kills the nerve endings where it doesn't even hurt anymore. You don't even know that you're burning. You don't even feel the pain. That's how deep of the burn it is, right? And then I started looking around at everybody and was like, wow, like spiritually, the world is on fire. Spiritually, people are burning alive. Literally burning a walking torches. Seriously walking torches. And the burn is so deep that they don't even feel the pain. Wow. At some point in our lives, each one of us in this room was burning a lot. Yeah. Wow. Spiritually on fire. Not in, a, not in a great way, but in the opposite way. With deep burns that we don't even feel the pain. Third degree spiritual burns. But thankfully, someone who was a farmer, who was a spiritual EMT, who's a spiritual firefighter, came with that spiritual fire extinguisher called the Word of God and said, hey, do you mind if I show you how to use this? This will put the fire out. Awesome. Because they saw that I was burning a lot. And I didn't even know it. I was like, I'm good. I don't even know. What are you talking about? They're like, no, but have you used the, the, the Word of God before? I was like, well, I know. But I know I've seen fire extinguishers. There's one right there. Like, yeah, I, I've been to places where they talk about them. And, you know, I think they're, they're, they actually work and all those kind of things. But I don't need to use it myself. I'm not on fire. But the disciple, thank God, the spiritual EMT saw me. He's like, no, I'm telling you, dude, you don't know you're on fire? I didn't know I was on fire. The, the burn is so deep that you don't even feel the pain. You think everything is awesome, as if you're on morphine, asking for more while you bleed out. Come on, bro. But thankfully, they were willing, and it set me down, and it taught me how, what the spiritual fire extinguisher, the Word of God, was all about. And they taught me how to use it, and how I can get access to God into the blood of Christ to cover me and remove that fire. And that's the same kind of vision that we have to have as a family. Amen. And it's kind of morbid, amen, but, but honestly, it's reality. That's right. And we just have to accept it. That people are literally burning alive and you don't even see it. And if you love anybody, 
You have to really hate somebody to see someone on fire and not put it out. That's right. Which you hate people as you walk by to the point where you see them on fire, you're like, someone else will take care of them. I'm too busy. I got to go. Right? We have to see people in the state that they're in because someone saw us in that state. That's right. And rescued us. How dare we not reach out to people on campus or in our neighborhoods? If you've been living in the same place and you still haven't talked to your neighbors after 20 years or even a year or a month, we have to go around. We've only met a couple neighbors so far. But how dare, how much do we have to hate somebody to not at least share what we know? Amen? Amen. I remember, uh, just real quick, um, something that's really stuck to my heart since uh, that time was uh, I was leaving Walmart. I just left campus, went to Walmart, and then I was heading to my second job. Um, and there was this guy, and at the time, I, I considered myself fairly fit. My morning job was a personal trainer, my evening job, job was a therapist. And so I didn't think of myself as like, I don't know. The reason I say that will come later in the story. But um, the, I was walking my car back, because I had my car in my car. And I was walking my car back to put it in like the little space, right, at Walmart. And uh, this other guy came up, who was a fit guy, maybe only a couple years older than me. Um, he's like, hey, can I help you put that back? And it just like kind of threw me off because as a guy, I'm sure the guys can relate. I'm like, why is this young guy helping me out? Come on. Like, yeah. I can see if I was like a young, like not to be weird, Come on. Like, I'm like a girl, you know? Like he was like, oh, let me help you. Here, look at me. I'm like an awesome guy. Right? <laughs> or like someone who was a little bit more elderly, and be like, oh, I want to help you. Sure, I'm sure I'll help you. <laughs> but for a fit young guy to help another fit young guy that you don't know, put a glass in the it's like, someone's off here. <laughs> Who God has given us. 
One way I like to look at it, I'm just going to put this out there real quick, is I like to look at it as what if God took Hilo, took Hawaii, Big Island, off the map of Earth, and it made it its own planet, and then threw it out into the, into the universe, and said, evangelize your world, evangelize your planet. How long is it going to take for us to evangelize that planet? This is it. What if this was it? He just pulled us off the map into our own little world and said, hey, the, the, the challenge is still there. Evangelize Hilo. Come on, bro. Well, we still have the same mindset. The reality of like, wow, now we're in charge of this little planet, and we're called to save everyone on this planet. You see, for me, that, that, that makes me think of it in a different way. This is my world. This is my universe. This is where I am in God planning my area of operation. I'm responsible, each of us, not just me because I lead the church here, each of us, this is God's church, amen, and we're all part of it. We're called to be Christ-like, which is a leader. We're called to lead Hilo to heaven. So when's it going to start? When are you going to start evangelizing? And I'm not saying we're not, amen, I'm not saying we're not, but I'm trying to gear, if there's anyone who has been struggling, if there's anyone who's been hurting in this area, any Bible talk who's been hurting in this area, then it's a, it's a time to reset that button, amen, that's what it is. I'm not trying to bash on people who've been going after it. That's awesome. Lead the way. But then grab your brother or sister who's been struggling and bring them along. Amen. Because it's our calling. Individually, it's our command that was given by God to go and evangelize the world, to go and evangelize Hilo, to go and be fruitful and bear fruit. It's an individual calling. So if we're not doing it as an individual and we just think we're going to tag along with someone else who is, we're lying to ourselves and we're deceived. Amen? Amen. So this is what we get to be embraced into that God has given us this opportunity to bear much fruit. Amen? Amen. Harvest is a priority. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Morning. You see, God's desire is for all people to come to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy yeah. 2, verse 4. It is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. There is no one on the face of this planet that God does not want to have with him. Yep. There's no one on the face of this planet that God does not want to see free from the captivity of their sin, Amen. from the pain, the insecurities, the fears, the worries, the shame, whatever they have feel in their lives from their past that the world has done to them. A lot of times people will blame God for what has happened to them from the world's sin. Yeah. People raised in, in, in an abusive relationships or in situations in life, in poverty and stuff, and say, if God loved me, why would he let this happen to me? The thing isn't that God does love you, it's the world that that happened to you. Sinners, generation after generation of sin has corrupted the world into what we see it today, Amen. with disease and poverty and pain and abuse and other <laughs> money. That was never God's intention, that was never God's design. God's design is for us to be fruitful and to be that pure fruit that he created us to be. And now it's up to us to remove those insects and that vermin from the fruit and bring them in and harvest it because it is pleasing to God, our Savior, to see all of his people saved. Amen. Not just his people in this room. But this is where it starts. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's what pleases God. It is a priority because that's what God designed it to be. Amen? Amen? And then, of course, we know this scripture very well, Matthew 28, verse 18. Let's we'll start there. I'm just going to ask someone in here to recite it. I'm as well. Oh, I didn't even worry. I didn't even realize when you opened up all quick like that. You woke up. I'm asking Alu to recite verse 18 and 20. But it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. This is the command of God Amen. to go and bear fruit, to go and make disciples. Come on. Is this a command in your heart? Is this what you truly are holding on to when you wake up? I'm a farmer of God's field. I'm a fisher of men and women. This is who I'm called to be, regardless of my title, regardless of the situation, regardless of what's happened in my life, regardless of the pain and, and so forth that's going on. God designed me to be this. He expects me to be this. He's commanded me to be this, Amen. a fisher of men, a harvester of God's field. Is this our heart? And if it's not, amen, guess what? Now we get to have it. That's as simple as it is. It doesn't take any crazy magic. Or, or, or circles and, and dances and whatever have you. 
It's simply a decision of, you know what? I'm a farmer. I'm a soldier, I'm a farmer, I'm a worker, I'm a disciple, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm a brother, I'm a sister, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, whatever have you. Boom, I'm back. That's what I'm going to do. And you just, you just decide. That's what, it's, that's what it comes down to. It's a simple decision. Amen? Are you guys with me? Amen. A simple decision is what it comes down to. Ensuring that our, our first and foremost, that our relationship with God is on point. Amen? Yeah. And if you're visiting us this morning and you're not really sure where you stand before God, amen. Simply, whoever brought you out, get with them. Study the Bible. Hey, what is the Bible? I, I've heard the Bible talked about a lot, even today, and so forth. <laughs> but where am I according to the scriptures? If I want to get, make sure that I'm going to the right place, put on that spiritual GPS, show me where I'm at so I know where I need to go. Yeah. That's number one. Got to get into the scriptures. Who cares about whatever else is, everyone else's opinions are? Study the scriptures. Amen? Amen. With whoever brought you out. Number two, go to God in prayer. Go to God in prayer to one be be fruit yourself to ensure your fruit yourself. Amen. But then to go and bear much fruit. You've got to go to God in prayer. And we have to expect, faithfully expect to be fruitful. Individually. We want to see this, this, this family double this year, which is more than possible. Yeah. It's going to happen on an individual level. To individually expect the next person I meet should be a disciple. No. It's up to them. If they decide to, to be with God or not, it's up to them. We can't do anything about them. We don't pressure anybody like that. It's not real. Fruit, amen? amen. But expect everyone you meet, you can be a disciple. You can amen. be a disciple. You can be a disciple. Awesome. Awesome. And then you go. And whether wherever they are, they're at in life, you meet them there and you walk them to the cross. Yeah. And you bear fruit, and it's not amazing. It's not like a shock of like, wow, we're fruitful. It's like, of course we're fruitful. Yeah. Who's next? Come on, bro. Me and you. Who's next? And you're going to bear more fruit. But it's got to happen on an individual level. Amen? amen. Yeah. Go with me to John 15, verse 16. You see, what the point I want to really drive home today, if we walk away with anything this morning, we're going to start wrapping it up here. If we walk away with anything this morning, is that we are called to be fruitful as individuals, disciples. Yes. It's not the Bible talk level, it's not the church level, the house church level, whatever have you, that is to bear fruit. It's us as an individual that's called to bear fruit. It's a command of God. It's simple as that. But as a family, we come together, we get to do it together and inspire each other through our small groups, through our prayer groups, through our discipling partners, through our church meetings of the body, and so forth, of keeping in with God's line, in line with what God calls us to do. Amen? Amen. Because simply it's where we're created to be. And if we're to see that here in John 15, verse 16, the Bible says, You did not choose me, but I choose you, and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. See, God has chosen you. He doesn't care about anything else. He's chosen you. He's designed you to be fruitful, to be powerful, a powerful man of God, a powerful woman of God. That's who you're designed to be. And with the help of God and with the help of godly men and women in your life, that's who you can be this year or continue to be this year. Amen? I know we have a lot of powerful men and women here. In Hilo, amen? amen. Yes. But that's what we have to be focusing on. Is that truly who we want to be this year? Again, I love going back to who do you want to be when you look back, or when you look into the future in 2018, January, who is going to be sitting here this morning? Come on. Who are you going to be this morning? 2018, January 22nd. Might not be a Sunday night. <laughs> but either way, wherever you are, who are you going to be? who's going to be standing next to you? As a brother or sister in Christ, one of your family members, a friend from work, some people from your classroom, who are now your best friends, who now the relationship with them in your life have been better than they've ever been in, in ever, yeah. that are going to be sitting next to you in church, and you're going to be in their Bible talk, or they might be in your Bible talk, like, hey, what are we going to do this week? Hey, guess who I met? Hey, guess what? Uh, our cousin, our distant cousin is coming out to church next week, and da 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 and all these things, but, but it really comes down to, you have to envision, where am I going to be? But it has to start today. Whoever you're going to be next year is going to depend on who you are today. Amen? Go with me to Romans 10. We're going to close out this one last scripture. Romans 10, verse 14. You guys fired up? Yeah. Oh, amen. Romans 10, verse 14. The Bible says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? This is talking about calling out for, for people to be brought in, for people to be saved. 
How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, I'm not going to ask everyone to look at your feet. My feet are ugly. They're actually pretty girly today. Nowadays. They don't keep them like I used to, I guess. But how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's who we are. Isn't that amazing? That's who God designed us to be. To be those with the beautiful feet that bring good news. I'm not talking about physically, per se. I'm sure a lot of you guys have very beautiful feet. I mean, come on, me. <laughs> <laughs> but what we're talking about here is spiritually. How beautiful are the feet that came and brought you good news during your life? How close are you to the people who shared their faith when you baptized them? Right. The, the amount of indebtedness you feel to them. If you weren't willing and diligent in the scriptures and faithful, I would not be sitting here this morning. Yeah. I'll still be on fire, if not dead already, but somewhere out in the world on fire, burning alive. Completely free. That's where I'd be. I'd probably definitely be dead. I believe. Oh, oh. Amen? But how beautiful are those feet? And that's the same kind of heart that we have to have it, and it should inspire us. That God has designed us to have those beautiful feet, to bring the good news to those in our lives. To bring the good news to this island. To truly save those who are on this island who are desperate for the word of God. Who are not sure how much they've been burning. Who are not even sure that they've been on fire at all. But we bring them the good news and we put out those fires. Amen. And we fill in this room. Not for the sake of just filling in the room with people and numbers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But because there's people who are out there who are not going to heaven. Yeah. That's how real it is. Yeah. Who are condemned to hell. And we, can, we have the opportunity to bring them home and love them and show them that, hey, I'm right there with you. But if God has rescued me, so I want to help rescue you. There's people who are hurting and need our help. Helpless and harassed. We bring them home. Amen. The harvest is ripe. Though we are few, we are the workers. And our God owns the harvest. Amen. Amen. Let us go out as a family. Let us go win and bring back what is already the Lord's in this island. Amen. To God be the glory.